You're listening to the Platinum Standard in Paranormal Talk, Paratopia, with Jeff Ritzman and Jeremy Vaney. Distinguished gentleman representative of Florida, Matthew Gates, and his honorable colleague, the distinguished representative also of Florida, Anna Paulina Luna, on behalf of the Department of Defense, I welcome you, son, daughter, to the skiff. Now, I know it may not look like much, just a gushied up motel room. But believe you me, this place is secured six ways from Sunday. No one's getting in, no one's getting out. As soon as I leave here, the door locks and that's it. So the moment that television zone David Grush, who might as well also be from Florida, gets here, we're going to get this party started right. Oh, actually, here he is. Speak of the devil. Speak of the devil. David, come on in. Okay, you three, this place, again, as I say, is totally secure. No one will hear nothing. No one will see nothing. It's eyes only in the room. But if you need me, just yell. I'm on the other side of the door, and I will hear you. Both of those things cannot be true, and yet they are, courtesy of your Department of Defense. In the event that you cannot make it to the door or your yells are muffled, I will see you on one of several hidden cameras buried in various vases and that television set there and in the ceiling all around the room. So again, yell if you need anything. I'm outside the door. Totally secured room. It's just the best we could do on no budget. Settle in and have a good skiff. David Grush, David, 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 so nice to see you. I'm glad that you could make it, and I'm sorry that our accommodations aren't better. Frankly, we couldn't afford to fly you in, and we had to start a GoFundMe to do this. And uh, since you weren't willing to pay for it yourself, uh, this is the best we could do, but I'm glad you're here. I'm glad we're here. And I will turn it over to my colleague, Anna Paulina Luna, if you'd like to say a few words. Sieg Heil. That's right, Sieg Heil. Where shall we begin? Yeah, well, first, let's begin by saying thank you very much for meeting me here. And uh, before we go any further, do you validate parking? Yeah. What the hell was that? Is everyone okay in here? I heard shouting. Yes, sir. Uh, that was just television's own David Crush using his cartoonishly loud voice to inappropriately set the tone here in the skiff, uh, per usual. Nothing to see here. Okay, son. This grizzled old veteran gets it. I will get out of your hair now and let you get back down to business. Son. So, David, we all know why we're here. To divert attention away from your sex trafficking charges? No. There are no charges. Sorry, I meant child prostitution allegations. Yeah! No. No one's talking about that. No one cares. Oh, I know. To distract from the fact that you show your colleagues nudie photos on your phone. No, David. Literally, no one cares about that. They all looked at them. We're here because my own colleagues hate me for ousting McCarthy. Erzähl uns von den außerirdischen Dummkopf. Yeah, right, Luna. Tell us about the aliens, dummy. Mm Mm-hmm, yeah, yeah, cool, the aliens. I'll tell you all about them, yeah. Is that a minibar? We're not allowed to drink in the skiff, it's just sodas. (laughs) What are you trying to say? What are you implying? That I'm an alcoholic, huh? That I'm a drunk? No. Yeah, because I'm not. Totally not. I beat that a long time ago. Okay. Yeah, you're saying okay, like I'm crazy or something. What, because of my PTSD? I beat that a long time ago. No, no one's... You're shadowboxing. No one's saying anything about any of that. Then what? My suicidal tendencies? Hmm? That I was locked up in a mental facility for a bit? Huh? I beat that. That time I got Ebola? That was for a day. Beat it. HIV AIDS? Worüber plappert dieser Idiot? Yeah, 
I know, right? It's crazy how uncrazy he wants us to think he is. And his man spread is amazing. I'll tell you, if I had a man spread like that, he'd be all over my phone. And into the eyes of my colleagues. I beat that too. A couple years ago. Yeah, so don't try to peg me as some sort of schizophrenic loon. David, David, let me just uh, cut you off there. No one is questioning your sanity or the state of venereal diseases or anything. Uh, we just want to know what you've learned about aliens. Because it seems that the issue is compartmentalization, right? Of various black budget projects, which actually we don't need to know anything about. I mean, come to think of it, I don't know anything about anything. But if you're saying there's some off-the-books shenanigans going on, then I'm going to pretend to be interested in that, and so is uh, Luna here and, and everyone else in Congress involved in this. Because... Pretending to care about issues, even pseudo-issues, even, you know, sideshow circus issues. Pretending to care about those things is what we do. And that's how we get reelected. We give the people what they want. Or pretend to. Anyway, let's have it. What do you got? Aliens? Interdimensional beings? What is it? Yeah, okay, well, what we're talking about in, in reality here... And I'm speaking to you as a physicist, which I am not, but I could be. Yeah, what we're talking about is more than, mm, I would categorize it as an sort of an all of the above sitch. An AOTA, if you will. Yeah, that's an intelligence term. By way of real estate agent. Okay, so, out with it. What are we talking about here? Documents? Documents, yeah. I've seen documents. Uh, one was, uh, said magic, top secret, eyes only. And it was about this group you may never have heard of called Majestic 12. And then there was another document called the Eisenhower document. It's all about what Eisenhower said happened. May never have heard of it. Um, and then I saw a video of a scientist that somebody showed me once that was, his name was, uh, Roberto. What was it? Rob, Rob Lazar. And he showed us on a chalkboard the inner workings of a sports model UFO. And that's probably an example of uh, aliens from the all of the above or the AOTA. Yeah. Okay. I don't know what any of those things are because I've never had an interest in any of this or, frankly, anything in politics ever. How about you, Luna? Erzähl uns von den Außerirdischen. Dieses Wissen muss ich meinem Meister in Chile zurückbringen. Oh, you have a master in Chile? I understand you, Luna. You know why? Because I speak fluent everything. Every language ever is the fluent thing that I speak, including Klingon. Okay, let's just, can we stay on topic here? Can I have my job back? Uh, maybe. I mean, uh, that, that's not up to me. But come on, let's just focus on the issue here. Who's coming to you in whistleblowing to the whistleblower about the whistleblown? A lot of people. A lot of people in government. A lot of people in military. People in civilian life. All sorts of people. You got uh, Lou Elizondo? You know him? Nope. Hmm? You ever heard of Richard Doty? No. Yeah, that's one. Hal Putoff. Can't say that I... No. I mean, if you really want to talk to somebody who knows something about something... Hal Putoff is your guy. He'll tell you all about the planet Serpo. Have you heard of the Serpo planet? I'm at a loss. That's a whole other planet. They've got UFOs. Who? And you know something? If you don't believe me, yeah. Yeah, I'd understand that. But if you don't believe me, why don't you just ask the Vatican? They know everything about everything about this. Uh, the Vatican is run by a libtard socialist communist priesthood. So... I'm not going to be talking to those fucking people, okay? Okay, then why don't you ask, I don't know, uh, Dr. Stephen Greer. This is a man who was once a small-town country doctor who was read into all the UFO projects at, uh, like a Washington party or something, yeah. Ask him what he knows about aliens. He'll tell you. He told me. Nope. Jeff Ritzman, it's Halloween time, and you know what that means. Boo. <laughs>
<laughs> that's that's correct. <laughs> you have always said that you do this show for selfish reasons. So what do you see the show as being, or do you see your selfish reasons? Uh, do you feel like you've gotten all you're going to get out of it for yourself? Or or what are you saying? What what do you think the direction is? Uh, I don't feel like ufology in general has anything to offer me anymore. I don't feel like there is really any point to visual analysis anymore. Pursuing the government cover-up entertaining or discussing it i find more and more very little that i have in common with anyone else in ufology besides you and i um <laughs> Isn't that sad uh yeah it is i think and uh, i mean in, in a lot of ways we're not on the same page with some stuff as we are others but i think by and large we agree with each other's thoughts a lot we trust on this each stuff. other like you're the only well, person i can think of that i'm like if you tell me Hey, dude in black cloth had a conversation with me in my living room. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. All right. And out of anyone else's mouth, no. <laughs> right, 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 right. Aloha and welcome to Paratopia. This is a brand new 2023 annual Jeff Ritzman Halloween bash. Um, and this one's going to be interesting. Well, hopefully they were all interesting. I don't know. Who knows? I don't know what your tastes are. Damn it. Nobody talks to me. Not the point. Uh, this is going to be interesting because, um, this whole, like, month, this arc into November is sort of, uh, Paratopia slash Jeff Ritzman month. Uh, because right now, or at least this weekend... I don't know if it's going to be released in sync with this episode, but this weekend um, I am, of course, as I have been doing for the past year, guest hosting Dreamland the last Friday of, uh, of every month. And so it just so happens that uh, Tyler Cokejohn is on, uh, and we're talking about the state of ufology, but primarily... Uh, at least for the subscriber section primarily, talking about Project Core and talk about the contributions of Jeff Ritzman. And we start off talking about um, the contributions and giving special thanks to, and in fact, the episode is dedicated to the late, great Carol Rainey. Um, so that's happening this weekend. Obviously, this is happening this weekend. And while it's going to end with what I think is my best interview with Tim Banal, um, it's going to begin with The Shroud Man. Oh, yes. Um, there were a couple of revelations that Jeff never made public. We'll get into that, um, and I'm going to reveal them. Um, but I also thought it would be kind of interesting and fun to listen to when he told my friend Tracy uh, about the Shroud Man revelations. Shroud, the Shrouded Man, essentially, if, if you're unfamiliar, a Jeff Ritzman uh, had experiences that were, you know, you could classify as abductions. But then they gave way to a tall shrouded being coming and talking to him. And he had a sit-down chat where he was basically like, jot this down. And Jeff took dictation and he told him, you know, you can share this with Jeremy and you can share this with one other person. And you'll know who that person is when the time is right. And it turned out to be my friend from high school, Tracy, who we had just interviewed with some other high school friends of mine about our Ouija board escapades back in high school. And for some reason, Tracy was the person. So I recorded his when we stopped the episode and we called her back. I recorded that. So wouldn't it be interesting to listen back to that now with you and um, give reactions as as I go along? Um, I don't know. Maybe? Let's see. But also, I mention this and do, am doing this because uh, Tracy, a few weeks ago, now we don't really talk. We're friends on Facebook, but we're not, you know, we're, you know, we're friends from from back in the day, but we're not like, you know. 
talking all the time. But she emailed me um, or, you know, DM'd me on Facebook that – I'll give the long story short – that she now believes she's an alien abductee and has been all of her life. And so I related it back to this Shroud Man thing like, oh, maybe this is why he was supposed to tell her about this. And when I said that to her, she didn't even remember this at all, <laughs> which I find fascinating. So at the end of the month, uh, Tyler is on this weekend, right, on Dreamland. But at the end of November, for Dreamland, the last Friday in November, I have Tracy on to talk about this and that. Um, her abductions and the Shroud Man stuff and everything in between, everything that's been going on with her. So please do listen to those two episodes as well when they come out. Um, and when I have her on... I will play this audio clip that we're going to dissect. I will play it in its entirety to preface my conversation with Tracy. So I'm not going to do that here. We're just going to do a, a reaction show segment to it, which ties in with my all new, <laughs> not on purpose, but it does, uh, YouTube show called He's So Vainy, which is just basically me reacting to ufological, consciousness, spirituality, kundalini, you know, go down the list of stuff, videos on YouTube. Uh, so it's a reaction show. It's part funny and part um, learny. <laughs> Thinky, learny, funny. So this, maybe this will be in that vein. I don't know. Let's, let's get to it. Um, and then afterward, I will share with you a couple of things Jeff never would uh, at least in public, and we'll get into that. Okay. Here is Jeff Ritzman telling Tracy Facetti the following. Um, it took a little while, but I wrote notes, and I was told that I could, uh, I was to sh share those with Jeremy and one other person whom I would know. Um, mm. When that was... And, uh, well, here's the funny part. I think it's you. <laughs> yeah. No. So. Right. <laughs> um, Isn't it cute the way he's so nervous here, right? And, like, who wouldn't be? This is uh, ridiculous. Like, the topic is ridiculous. He doesn't know Tracy. Um, so, and Jeff being Jeff, as we all know, he wouldn't want to be doing this. <laughs> so. There you go. So I just read this, and um, and uh, and and so I've done my thing. <laughs> uh, it says we, meaning Earth and people, are smaller than the smallest measurement that mankind is capable of measuring. This is in comparison to the larger perspective, which has no known end and is self-perpetuating. The fractal is the single greatest discovery of mankind. The answers from the artist to the scientist are there. Mankind will never be able to see with technology what the micro subatomic particles really are because what exists there is another universe, infinitesimally small and likely a replication of our current sense of reality, meaning space, people, and technology, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. See, I find that interesting that we, the people within this particle world or particle universe, are infinitesimally small. Let's, like, we're so small that we wouldn't be able to detect ourselves with our own instruments <laughs> if we were looking at a particle uh, or this, this particle. Um, that's interesting. Th see, this is where um, back in the day, before we went public with this, and I think this was the thing that, that we, we had recorded a few times and Jeff had... Um, received a quite literal thrashing on his back. It looked like he got into a fight with a Wolverine after we recorded this and we're going to put it out. And then he decided, no, let's not put it out. I think that was this, right? Um, if there are any uh, Peritopian historians out there, let me know. Um, but I'm pretty sure. And eventually, for some reason, we were... I don't know if he just powered through and did it anyway or um, realized that the time is right. Probably it was that. It was that the time is 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 now, and so we put it out. Um, but before we put it out, 
we had talked about privately um, that by doing so, we were jeopardizing our show. Like, Jeff was putting his credibility on the line with this whole, with the whole thing. The fact that the Shroud Man had happened in the first place, the fact that his experiences had changed. And he was sort of worried, I, I think a little bit worried for me. Like, not that I had any credibility, but maybe he thought I did, uh, that I would be going down with the ship um, if we did this. But also, um, there was the sense, I just, in our discussions, I mean, sort of what we came to is like, you know, maybe it won't be that bad. Maybe it'll be like the people who stick with us, stick with us, and it will weed out the the bastards who don't belong anyway. And it surely did that. There were bastards who didn't belong who went on. And one guy in particular was um, upset about the plank length that, you know, the plank length is the smallest measurement we can make. And if you're talking about something smaller than it doesn't exist, therefore this is bullshit. Therefore Jeff is lying. But what Jeff had maintained all along, and he said it in the public episode, Echoes in a Yawning Chasm was the title of the episode. And in fact, it's, um, I think, I don't know if it, I don't know if in the re-release of Paratopia it's out yet, but it's been on YouTube this whole time. So I'll, I'll provide a link to that if you want to listen to that episode, if you haven't heard it before. Um, so what he said in the episode, what he, he made clear several times over, is that he doesn't treat what he's even saying here to Tracy um, as necessarily factual. Maybe it's more of a sort of thought experiment in a way, like whatever this being is, giving this to him and telling him this as if it's true, but to see where it goes, see what we do with it, and maybe that's more important. Uh, We never really, you know, we don't know. At the end of the day, we don't know. But Jeff, you know, his mantra was always, you know, don't trust an alien. Never trust an alien because, as you see in the literature all the time, any sort of big revelations never quite pan out, do they? Um, So he took all of this with a grain of salt, even though he didn't feel as though he should. Like when he was in the presence of this shrouded person, he felt great. You could hear it in his voice after he had had a, a meeting with this guy. Jeff would sound like, you know, he had just taken a spa day or something. Like he sounded completely balanced and not at all anxious, like just totally relaxed. And it was interesting. Um, so everything in him screamed that this is the truth, right? Like this is to be trusted. And yet he still held back his full trust. And he made that uh, known publicly on the show. And yet and still people found a way to hate on Jeff and call him a liar and all of this. But interestingly, that person who I'm talking about, who specifically, you know, went after him about the plank length thing. um, He was someone who would, who was just a complete asshole. He would call me. He was one of those people who got me to not want to talk to listeners who were like, I have to call you. I have to talk to you. You have to talk to me on the phone. Like there are certain people out there, not a lot, but there are some, who are like adamant that you must talk to them at all costs. And when you're new to this, as as I was back then, you think like, oh, this person needs me or something. Something's up here. And then it just turns out, no, they just want to babble at you and then hang up. <laughs> like they don't even want a conversation. They just, you know, want to victimize you with their theories of things. And then, and then that's it. They're done with you. And he was that, except that he would also now and then chime in and like offer to guest host or throw shade on Jeff as a host and basically say, I need to get rid of him and he should be my guest host or or he should be my uh, co-host, um, which is ridiculous because, well, one, I mean, Peritopia was, uh, you know, it was both our child, but it was Jeff's brainchild. I mean, he was the one who initiated it, right? So... No, there was no my show that Jeff is a part of. It was our show. And if you wanted to be technical, you could say, hey, it was his idea first. Maybe it was his show. In any event, it did get rid of the riffraff. Oh, yes, it did. Um, I don't know what sort of effect this had on anyone who did pay attention and, and cared to. 
or who ran with it. I thought it was interesting that um, we would start seeing articles uh, pop up in various science rags about, um, is the Planck length really the smallest? And, you know, now at this point, um, there's so much just odd physics shenanigans. It always just struck me as stupid even then, but now it's like playing out. That like, how can you say something is definite? How can you say there is a law <laughs> A law of of uh, size, you know, I, I'm very skeptical of physics, laws in physics being a thing. Um, it's more like this is how things appear to work for now from this angle, and we call them laws because we like to have a sense of of conclusion, a sense of the definite, and and use that to springboard further knowledge. Uh, that's all a law really means. It's sort of a to me, anyway, it's like a play. It's like a represent representation of the springboard for new, new avenues. And maybe that's what this um, shroud man thing was supposed to be in some small way. Because obviously, you know, we ain't uh, exactly the mainstream here. So I don't know whose ears this was supposed to get into. But anyway, right now it is getting into Tracy's ears. We too live within. Uh, to our perspective, a larger version of a particle world to back out from Earth to the end of reality itself without human perception is the trick. There's currently no ability to do this. Your reality includes infinite space that is contained within a single particle. Everything you know or can perceive, and we've only seen the smallest portion of that, is within that single particle. There are other particles there are within those particles other intelligence unimaginable to you. The reality of those particles, too, is imperceptible to you within your physical body. Man, there's a lot there that I'm not even still to this day sure about as I'm listening in terms of, like, what's actually being said there. Because the way the language is flowing... Uh, is the Shroud guy saying they too are from Earth or from an Earth, which he later says is a, you know, wherever he's from is a particle here, like not a parallel world, but a particle that is here on Earth or within our ability to, if we could, perceive it. Although, isn't it interesting too that um, he's saying the reality of these other particles, which are themselves worlds or universes, are imperceptible to us within our body, which implies that there is another way to perceive them, perhaps the way in which he is coming to talk to Jeff right now, something more psychic or astral than science, which would be good, because if we can crack that code, that means we don't need to uh, be geniuses. It's available to us right now. But I got to say, I mean, I am a little bit confused, and I didn't catch this the first 8 million times I listened to this, but I don't, can you tell, is it a fault of uh, Jeff's dictation, or is it being implied, or I guess outright, you know, we're supposed to believe, that uh, there is not really a difference between the Shroud guy and us, or the Shroud guy's people and us? Because it sounds like Jeff sort of smears the language um, between talking about him and talking about humans, right? Or is that just me? Um, so sometimes I get confused of like, wait, Jeff, are you talking about us or are you talking about them? Or is there not supposed to be an us and them? <laughs> is that um, kind of the point? Is like all all sentient life is this smear of particles and parallels, Universes within universes next to, I guess, sort of facsimile universes. If you have any help on that issue, please do let me know. Time. Time is perceptual and only governed by perception. If your world had no inhabitants, time would become irrelevant. If your world had no inhabitants to exist on it, your world would not exist at all nor would your perceptible vision of the cosmos. It would simply instantly cease to exist. Now that's interesting to me because that's um, one of the ideas I've toyed with over the years is that as we um, destroy nature and as we 
uh, do genocide on this planet, um, do we become vaguer and vaguer? Because if all of our sense of reality is held together by all of these different organisms perceiving each other, and you take away their unique perception, then does the reality get weaker? Because that aspect of it no longer exists. And therefore, do we get vaguer and vaguer? Do we just sort of evaporate at some point? Um, this would seem to indicate that yes. But also, it's interesting because this is really saying, um, well, I mean, is it saying, like, if you take away all perception, then, okay, Earth doesn't exist anymore. Um, which I guess is true because, you know, from the scientific point of view, if everything is just like particles and waves or waves that be that present as particles that then build and present as bigger and bigger things, but all of this is an illusion or all of this is, you know, the illusion is that it's coming the way that we perceive the world and, and live in it comes from our very specific organs <laughs> that that can perceive in the way that these organs do. So, yeah, I guess if we're all gone, gone Earth as we know it, just like I was saying about other creatures, um, Earth as we know it doesn't exist because it only exists as we know it to us. Um, but is this also further saying that the universe that sort of revolves around us, I mean, are we saying that that we're it, that Earth is it in this universe and everything else is kind of a... Um, a facsimile or like, well, kind of the way if you um, drill down into particles, um, eventually you can't see nothing. So you're going to have to see something. So you're going to be inventing something to see, um, which may be why particles seem to react to the observer because you're actually creating the thing on a level because you can't see nothingness. So you have to see something. So you're, you know, the act of observation creates something to see. Does that work on the macro level? Like the further out into space you go, you can't, there is no limit to it. Uh, so the further you look, the more there's going to be to see. I mean, because if that's true, then that implies, does it not, that there are no other beings out there? There are no other inhabited planets. There's just more planets and stars and stuff for us to see. But it's through the act of looking that creates it. Therefore, there's no life on those planets. Is that a bridge too far? Am I reading too much into that? Let me know. Your science has already made note of quantum particles that come in and out of existence instantly and constantly. Within those particles are worlds, intelligences, and all live their history in the wink of your eye. To those within these particles of reality, their time is long, seemingly billions of our years. You see their birth, life, and transcendence in nanoseconds. To you, it's just a strange particle with little explanation that comes into reality and leaves just as quickly. Now scale that up. You too are within a particle that will one day simply cease and will wink out of its existence. You and all other intelligence will long have left this perception of reality, so not to worry. The question is, where have all these intelligence gone to? This as of yet unknown to me. Now, that's really fascinating to me that this being uses uh, birth, life, and transcendence, not death, and talks about, you know, you're here and then you're transcending, right? Like when our particle pops, <laughs> we won't be here anymore. But the being, and presumably the being's people, don't know if there are people don't know um, where everyone goes when they die or when they transcend, when the entire experiment is over, where do they go? Um, that's interesting, right? Like, why are you calling it transcendence if you don't actually know that there's transcendence, if you don't know where they go? I wish we knew more about what such a being knows about transcendence, but we don't quite get there. I know you're, what you're thinking, and yes, there is someone looking at our particle, but there is someone else looking at his particle, and so on. Now take this straight line of the fractal model and expand it to parallels. These two exist in the same framework and described. 
He meant as described. They are the echoes of other realities. The question is, which one is the source of the echo? What you have heard is true in a sense. Every molecule is a yawning chasm to another world. If you desire contact, you do well to take a lesson from Horton. Listen to the smallest particle, not the vastness of your perceived cosmos. Yes, that was a Horton Hears a Who reference. I am not from outside your existence. I have come from a particle in your world, one older and more complex than your science has even thought exists. In a strange sense, you've already known this when you theorize they exist in the space between space. In a certain sense, this is true, but we are beginning to question what that space really is. So that's fun. That was um, the space between space thing is something that Jeff and I shared immediately when we first met each other. That was one of like the connective tissue moments of like, oh, like minds. Um, So what that's about is when we were children and probably well into adulthood, (laughs) uh, we used to ponder what is the space between objects? Like I... I'm looking at my computer screen now, or if I look at the wall across the room, what's the stuff in between all of that? Because if you look, you can, at least your eye perceives what looks like particles, right? It looks like it's not all solid, even as you're looking. Um, And then what's in between whatever that is, you know, those, those little I'm calling them particles, but probably they're not in the scientific sense. Who knows what, I don't know what the eye is doing. Rods and cones, I don't know, people. I'm just saying, there's stuff between stuff. What's that stuff? And what's the stuff between the stuff in the stuff, you know? And apparently, um, the shrouded being is as high as we were. <laughs> and uh, asking the same questions. It's It's interesting that, like, That the big questions of the universe are childlike questions, right? But also that very specifically he is, well, I mean, by invoking Horton Hears a Who, um, he's invoking the childlike nature of it all. Um, But also, can it be a coincidence that this was sort of like one of the bonding moments between Jeff and and me when we first met? Um, Was this shared childish question that seemingly no one else was asking and then until we met each other and then we were like oh my brother that can't be a coincidence right anyway jeff's wrapping it up here so there you are i'm out that's really amazing thank you mm-hmm. does that mean anything to you you know as in I've like why you <laughs> yeah no 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 uh, i've been searching for a lot of answers yet lately and i really needed that reminder that there's a lot more than us now i can't possibly with my finite mind grasp everything that's being communicated there but it it resonates with me on many levels you know you know how you can't really explain mm-hmm. but who is horton is horton here's a who that you know? <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> yeah Horton yeah, the giant who? elephant <clears throat> listening to the tiny particle. Wow. That's where he says they are. And I, I mean, I, at that point, I and mean, I, I didn't get to tell Jeremy this before we rang you back, but that's where I got the, um, this kind of visionary, which happens around him, is uh, you get these pictures. Excuse me. Huh. And, and the picture that I got, um, was like, uh, and I mean, it's as bizarre as it sounds. It was me sitting at a drafting desk, and I don't even have a drafting desk, but it was me sitting at a drafting desk, and then it pulled backwards to the earth, and then it pulled backwards and backwards and backwards and backwards through all this stuff, and it ended up that what it looked like was white with like uh, like dryer lint. <laughs> it looked like dry. It looked like a little piece of dryer lint. And that little piece of dryer lint was a particle. Now, I find this interesting because certainly when I picture particles in my beady brain, I picture something that's like perfectly spherical. And I think Jeff did too. But he's seen something that looks more like dryer lint. And it turns out that that is correct. 
um, that whatever the latest thing is, again, we started seeing things in science that were like confirming some of this stuff. And that was one of them um, that I don't know what kind of microscope they're using, but that, yeah, it has more of a shape of uh, sort of dryer lint, not quite perfectly round. And uh, and so then it, when it backed out from that, there was a scientist looking at this particle, but that particle was my entire universe. And then it backed out from him, and the whole thing kept repeating over and over and over and over and over and over. Um, wow. And it was just like – I was like, what? <laughs> like that's it? That's what this is? Uh, it just keeps going backwards and backwards, and that's where the spiral comes in, Jeremy. That's where the spiral is. That is the fractal. The fractal is the same things doing the same over and over and over and over, mm-hmm. which – this is and this is what like came to me after it was all over was you know how I hear you say things like well you are god mm-hmm. well you are <laughs> you are because you're the one looking through the microscope you know it's you you're the one you know through each of our own little perceptual windows we're looking through the microscope and yet there's somebody behind us looking through their microscope and the guy looking at his and the guy looking at his and it just keeps going. But they're all you. Mm-hmm. See, that's the bizarre thing. Well, uh, the first, um, you know, <clears throat> abduction experience where I saw beings mm. uh, that took place in the East Village was, <sighs> you know, me waking up into this dream of coming out of my bedroom and saying good morning to my mom and then realizing that I'm in a dream. Uh-huh. And then waking up and coming out of my bedroom and realizing I'm in a dream and then waking up over and over and over again. Uh, right. but, but it was all different versions of myself, including a female, including a little boy, incl- you know, like every sort of version of myself was doing this. Uh, right. And then at some point I would become aware that I'm dreaming and then I would wake up and it just kept going on and on and on. But then through that, breaking through that was – what I perceive to be the reality of the situation, which is me lying somewhere and having these, you know, the gray beings in the tunics uh, standing over me, staring at me. Right. And, you know, in the abduction literature, you know, it's always out there. Well, they're doing operations. They're experimenting on you or whatever. But, <laughs> right. But this sounds like that, yeah. doesn't it? This sounds like, no, these are the guys staring at our particle. <laughs> and, right. And those are all of the various particles of – you know, if you want to put it that way, like all of the interconnected human existences. Uh, uh-huh. And then the thing that sort of is stepped back from that and looking at all of these uh, various human existences is this other thing, you know, that yeah. we call the, the gray or whatever. Yeah. Uh, anyway, well, that's, what, I... that's what it put me in mind of. Although maybe now listening back to this, uh, maybe it would be more true to say, that if any of this is true, that the gray beings in staring into our particle are seeing all versions of me in parallels, right? Because didn't the Shroud Man differentiate between particles, uh, which are the universes, and then they have these parallels, these sort of echoes. Um, anyway, let's get back to me interrupting Jeff so I can say arrogant stuff. I mean, I got the sense that that because um, uh, I was thinking I was seeing me in all these different timelines or all these various parallel universes, but mm-hmm. well, I guess that's sort of what it's saying, right? Is that well, it is kind of. I mean, it, the question is, is that they want you know what what he's saying is that they don't know which one is the source of the echo, you know? Like I find it really amazing that there's stuff that he doesn't know. <laughs> yeah, and because, he's even interested you know, in the stuff between stuff. So yeah. we're, we're on level with this guy if if we're catching on to the things between things. But uh, as <laughs> as I told Jeremy, he said this is the most rudimentary, like, kindergarten explanation. This was not, you know, uh, this was not all of it. And it certainly doesn't define, you know, where he comes from. But I did, um, I mean, before, you know, he just stood up. I mean, it was really abrupt this time, which was odd because after I got done writing, I said – you know, he stood up and I just looked up at him and I realized again how freaking tall he is. <clears throat> and I said, are we ever going to meet anyone else? Like, is there ever going to, is there anyone else out there, you know, in space is what I meant. And, um, yeah. and, um, and he said, um, at some point, but 
don't be surprised if it's you, (laughs) which I thought was interesting because, you know, I just and earlier today I was just picturing like, you know, what happens if we hear a signal from this nanoparticle and it's us, you know, in which case that's it. That's what he's talking about because it's all us. Um, It's all I mean, and this is all within our perceptual um it's not to say we're the only ones. That's not – I don't think that's what he meant. I think he means for us, for our kindergarten you know, education here or, or uh, answer here is that what you're looking at is you. And, uh, and, and there are others that are all around you all the time, uh, but they are small. Um, and incidentally, <laughs> um, I – I find this – this was the most mind-blowing thing that literally kept me awake until like 6.30 this morning. Yeah, I don't, uh, I don't blame you. By well, others who are small, does he mean people who just haven't woken up at all? <laughs> I mean I don't know. I, uh, I mean one of the – I mean one of the earliest, earliest things that happened to me in studying UFOs was uh, – Meeting a man who was in his 70s who claimed to me to be – and I had no reason to disbelieve him because his credentials all checked out and and where he – you know his papers at work and his IDs and all that was all very solid. And he said that he was a photographer and he was um, charged to go in and photograph a very sensitive object. And when I asked him what it was, he he just kind of looked at me and he goes, well, it was a fucking flying saucer is what it was. And he almost, he almost acted angry about it, you know. And he's like, you know, I don't, I, I'm old and I don't care anymore. He's like, but I'm telling you, they're real. And he says, but here's where no one believes anything that I've said for years about this. He said there was no way to get into this. It wasn't like, you know, there was a, a ladder that came down or anything like that. He said there was a hole in the top. And he had to be in a like a uh, like a diaper harness, he called it, and lowered into this thing by a crane. He said it was inside of a hangar. He didn't know where the hangar was because they blindfolded him, flying him in. And he said when they lowered me in, uh, they told me to be prepared for um, a disorienting effect, disorientating effect. And he says when they lowered me inside – of this, uh, what looked to be like a 35 foot wide thing. It was bigger inside than the hangar was inside. Meaning this thing could not possibly have contained all of that space within this tiny little thing. He said it was twice as big as the hangar when they put him through the hole, when it was only 30 feet wide and the hangar was, you know, something like 800, 900 feet wide. So, um, that in this sense makes some kind of weird sense to me that, you know, the space between space opens up and, um, and, and, you know, mass and density and, and all of that, this is all playing into all these particle things and, you know, how do they get big? And well, they're not big, you know, they're small, um, you know, and everybody, everybody thinks probes when you see some small little craft float in the air. Well, that doesn't mean it's small, um, inside. So, you know, it, all of this. I mean, that just kept me awake. I was thinking about that guy in that <laughs> in that little disc, seeing this huge world inside, and um, uh, and I was just like, that makes perfect sense to what he's saying. And ordinarily, my motto is never trust an alien. But <laughs> how do you how do you throw this out the window and go, nah? <laughs> you can't. Yeah. No, you, can't. you really can't. And there endeth the tape. Isn't that something uh, David Grush made a claim about recently? That there are certain objects, UFOs, that have a bigger interior than exterior. And also, isn't that what the what Doctor Who, <laughs> Horton hears a who, Doctor Who, I sense a theme, uh, flies around in, right? A telephone booth that's actually a, a giant spaceship on the inside. Yeah, I don't know what to make of any of that, but there it is. Now... I will share with you um, the two revelations. I don't remember if it was related to this, um, 
or a previous conversation that he had with this this being. Um, and now that I think of it, was this conversation actually, did he say, Jeff, take this down because he wanted us to share this? Was it that we tried to share previous conversations that he didn't want us to share? And then he was like, fine, jot this down. You can tell Jeremy, there will be one other person you need to tell, and then you can share it with the audience. Um, my old man brain is, is, uh, not functioning as it used to. Um, if if anyone else is like, again, a Paratopia historian, a turge of some sort, <laughs> let me know. Um, it's really neither here nor there. Here are the revelations, though. So, But first, let me just say why he never revealed these. It wasn't because they were a big secret. In fact, these were two things that this being told Jeff he could say publicly. But he never did because... Uh, for two different reasons. He would tell them to you personally if it made sense in the context of a deep conversation you were having. So actually, I, I think there are a couple of Paratopia listeners out there from back in the day who he did tell um, when we met up with them. Um, and I think maybe at a conference or something, you know, personally one-on-one. In that context, it makes sense to tell these things. And, and also, you know, after you get a, se- a sense of who Jeff is as a person, that he's not BSing you. Because um, one of these sounds like it could be important, and then the other one sounds like BS. <laughs> and isn't this all the trickster element when you think about it? So the first one is Jeff had asked him, what are you, you know, uh, or who are you kind of thing. And he said, I am an Alad. Now, we don't know how that's spelled, (laughs) but it's to me, it it sounded like Allah, or it sounded like Aladdin, like a genie in a bottle. But I hadn't immediately put together that, oh, Aladdin, Aladdin's lamp is actually also Muslim. Like, is there a Muslim flavor to this? Um, Which, of course, then gets into the jinn, right? Which is interesting. But Jeff's problem with saying that out loud is that it's silly. And it will negate everything else that he's saying. It's like saying, oh, who are you? Well, I'm Valiant Thor. Oh, okay. Never mind. You know, (laughs) like he doesn't want to be a contactee. Who are you? I'm Viv from Venus. I'm here to tell you not to destroy the planet. Like, you know, we've seen enough of that contactee bullshit that Jeff didn't want to be that contactee bullshit, even though, you know, there's no escaping the fact that he's having a sit down chat with this shrouded being, right? But like to say like, oh, he's an Alad is meaningless outside of causing some embarrassment if you're at all (laughs) self-aware, right? So privately, he would ask various researchers, yes, including Phil and Brogno, unfortunately, um, have you ever heard of this, an Alad? And nobody had heard of it. No one had come up with anything. So that remains a mystery. Uh, also, I think he didn't want people to start claiming that they had also been speaking to Alads. Like, he didn't want it to become a bullshitty thing that someone steals uh, and runs with. Back in the day, people used to steal from us. I don't know if you realize this, but they weren't really the those kind of people. They were actually the people that you tend to trust who would like listen to Paratopia and then present our ideas as their own ideas the next week on their blogs or their shows. And everyone would ooh and on ah be like, Oh wow, you you're amazing, man. You're so smart. And it's like, no, we said that like last week or two weeks ago. And it, you know, this would recur all the time. So we knew that they were just like listening and taking from us. Um, now that's, you know, as much as that sucks <laughs> to not be credited for the smart stuff, it would really be a tragedy if if the dumb stuff became a thing and we infected New Age with more New Age, you know? So we kept that one close to the vest. But the other one, for a different reason, which is, why are you here? Uh, what is it that you're, you know, what are you doing with humans? And essentially what he said was, we're observing you because there is a singularity coming. And for our people, it was you know, a blissful or a uh, positive experience. But we don't know what's going to happen with you. We don't know how you're going to react. 
back then, the only singularity I knew about at the time was um, I knew that they called black holes singularities. Um, but then, of course, it turns out also the merger of humans and technology is also called a singularity. AI, uh, an AI event would, I guess, if we merged with AI, would be a singularity. So um, Jeff felt a responsibility to not share that, even though that was what this was about, according to this being. He didn't want to share that, even though he was told he could, because he thought that there was a responsibility there to not scare people. Because, again, never trust an alien, right? <laughs> um, so for all the naysayers of Jeff Ritzman, which there weren't a lot, really, surprisingly, considering the big turnabout with, with this, but I think with Jeff, most people are in it. If you're in for a penny, you're in for a pound. Like, you know you, you can trust this guy. If you trust him in the beginning, nothing's changed here, you know? Um, but there were naysayers, of course, and I just wish that they knew what I knew, which is what he held back to, A, continue to sound as credible as possible, given the circumstances, and B, out of a sense of not wanting to scare people or give someone some sort of, like, weird future event that may or may not occur, that may or may not be totally positive, <laughs> um, but now it's interesting because as we're seeing this push to at least tell us that artificial intelligence is alive, I don't believe that it is, but we sure want it to be. Um, you know, we're, we're inching ourselves closer and closer to at least that one definition of singularity. And is that what he's talking about? Is this guy a cyborg? <laughs> is he part program and part not? I don't know. Um, never got that far. Never even got to the definition of singularity. Jeff never asked him, hey, what's a singularity? As far as I know. What do you mean by that? Um, so these things are, once again, they're presented as are all um, even abduction type experiences presented the, with the stagecraft of an honest, open exchange but, of course, they actually promote more questions, don't they? And they actually call attention to themselves and reveal themselves in some way to be at least partially bullshitty. At least the abductions do. I'm not so certain about this exchange with this being. Because, I, again, I don't buy the thing about the Planck length or, you know, that we have any handle in physics. So I'm open to all of the particle stuff, you know, particle worlds. But I will tell you, the thing I'm not open to is is the idea that w what ended their relationship was that this man's cloak, if I remember correctly, Jeff was touching it and r realized, or I guess the shredded being said, yeah, he, like there was a familiarity to it and the shredded being was like, yeah, it's what we used to wrap you in when we would <laughs> take you as a kid. And Jeff, like, jumped back and was like, oh, okay, so you are the abducting force that I've been afraid of my whole life, and I trusted you, and now I'm scared, and this being was taken aback by Jeff's being taken aback, and was like, all right, calm down, pal, I guess I'll come back when you're more mature and, and figure you can handle this, and then that was it. I think that was the end of their relationship. Jeff, Jeff never did trust him after that. Um I guess the thing that I find bullshitty about that is that this being wouldn't wouldn't know that Jeff would react that way. Like to to my mind, there is a a, a stagecraft or a play going on there. He knew full well what would happen. I think I'll I'll just you know let's leave that a mystery. Let's let that hang in the air. Why that would be the case? Why would he go through that? Why would he put Jeff through that? Was he expecting something different? Was he testing Jeff to see if something was different? Or was he breaking off the relationship as organically and completely as possible by reinstating that fear in Jeff? Or is there another option? I don't know. Anyway, that's the Shroud Guy. If you want to hear more of um, uh, Tracy and, and I... Talking about it now, uh, all of this, um, as I say, the, the last Friday in November, 
which will be my last dreamland of the year, um, we're going to talk about it. So get ready, get set, go. But not right now. That's like in a month. Right now, let's clear our palettes and enjoy the sweet, sweet stylings of one Tim Banal, host of the uber-popular podcast Banal of America, the news, what would he be called? I don't know what his title is over there at uh, Coast to Coast AM. News editor? News Newsman? Harvey Newsman? Is that his name? Um, he basically posts that he, you know, he has to like come up with the news stories or find them and rewrite them and post them on Coast to Coast AM. Uh, that's his day job, folks. Be jealous. Here he is, Tim Banal. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Ladies and germs, this man needs no introduction, but we'll introduce him anyway. He is America's sweetheart. <laughs> he is Banal of America's own Tim Banal. Tim, welcome, uh, to the Paratopia thing. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, well, you know, old timers, man, old timers. Paratopia, but all of America. <laughs> I remember when we were like uh, among the half dozen podcasts that, <laughs> that existed. Now that uh, now that there's several thousand. Yeah, I think it's kind of cool that we became friends and remained friends through the years too. Because, um, I don't know. I, I don't know how rare that is between just like you know, podcasters or whatever, but it seems like, you know, a lot of them, uh, they come and go. And, and when they come, it's with like fangs out. And yeah. Claws. Yeah. <laughs> well, yes, I'll say this is, you know, I, all, when we first became friends, you were very, you, you had a lot of online skirmishes at the time. So I'm like, Oh geez, I hope this doesn't go south with this veiny character, but we've become the best <laughs> of friends. Like if we've been friends for like 15 I want to say we've been friends for like 15 years now, I say, or thereabouts. So it's, yeah, it's been that long. Right. It's been, it's pretty crazy. Well, I actually, I wanted to, I've been trying to think of some questions that I don't think anyone's asked you. And naturally, uh, I put them on my phone and now can't find them. But I think I remember <laughs> them. And I definitely right. know that I wanted to start with somewhere in that realm of what we're talking about now, actually. Which is, it seems to me that Banal of America... Um, when you came on the scene with your podcast, um, you are basically non-confrontational. And then, like you say, if, if someone needs to be hung, they're, you're going to give them enough rope to let them hang themselves. Yeah. Um, so that means that your personality, I mean, obviously your personality comes through in your voice and all that, but really like who is Tim Banal probably doesn't come through in that. But then who is Tim Banal? You know, you start branching out and doing other podcasts like um, as a guest. Yeah. Or like we start doing, you know, a comedy show together and people get to see, you know, who is right. Tim Banal. So I wanted to ask you, did that coming sort of coming out with like, OK, this is who I am. I'm not just a voice asking questions, but I have a personality and this is it. Did that affect your listenership at all in a positive or negative way? Um. Well, I don't know when it happened, but yeah, at some point I started out sort of like the gee whiz, like this is, this is all so exciting and fun and, and it's still kind of exciting and fun, um, in a lot of ways, but it was like, I was very deferential, I guess, to the guests and kind of just let them say crazy stuff and then would sort of challenge them if, if it was like, well, what do you think? Why do you, you know, people say this when, what, what do you say to the people that say, and then it's like, I'm really going to just be confrontational but put it in the words of a hypothetical other person somewhere along the way i got more ornery i think just from being in the yeah. field over the years so like if you listen to the more recent years shows you can certainly there's a an orneriness um to my to my vibe now people like they got it's funny because like people listen to the old shows they're like oh you're so sweet and nice and and young and now and like i have this weird reputation for being like grumpy uh, which is kind of funny to me because it's like, yeah, I'm kind of a grumpy ass, but I'm mostly happy go lucky all the time. Um, I, I don't know necessarily. I don't think that really hurt the listenership of the show. What I, I mean, I would venture to guess though, is that um, 
I think, the, I, and I hate to get into this in a sense because it's like so hot button, but I don't think really, uh, I think that maybe Paratopia might be in the same boat as but all America in a way where it's like the political polarization of the last six years or so, like, uh, I'm sure I lost a fair amount of listeners who were MAGA people. And it's like, huh. I just couldn't, I mean, I'll give you an example in a way. Right before the 2016 election, I was invited on a show um, uh, and I was, and they wanted me to talk about the Cubs winning the World Series and the Cubs baseball curse because I'm a baseball fan. And this was like in October of 2016. And I'm like, no, dude, fuck that. Why don't you have me on and talk about this election? Because this is like pretty serious and like we don't want this Trump guy to get elected, man. And it's like, oh, no, 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 we can't even, we don't want to get into that. We don't want to do that. You know, and to me, it was just like, I could not sit idly by and sort of sit on the fence and not be like, look, this guy's an asshole. He's a con artist and you you can't, you know, and then he was elected and all hell broke loose and everything else. So it was, but, but I think that maybe I probably lost a fair amount of listeners who were just like, everything got so polarized and I'm one of those, I just couldn't sit back and be like, I mean, look at we, you and I did like political election night shows. We're going to do one next November, I'm sure. Also, so I think that, and then just kind of like spinning down the show and and sort of the very sporadic nature of how it has been for the last few years, it's like out of sight, out of mind. So in a way, I'm kind of, uh, but all of America's coming back for the people who haven't heard because I've been kind of circumspect about it. But um, we're going to be rolling out new shows very soon. And so in a way, I almost have to rebuild the audience in a way, but that's fine. I mean, I was never like one to... Uh, harp on the numbers or anything. Like I never really like looked at that. Uh, I mean, once or a few times a year, I would just take a look just to see. But it's not. I'm not like fastidiously looking and being like, oh no. Uh, I mean, it, 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 the website. I don't know who you hosts your podcast anymore, but Cyber Ears, the place, the place that used to host, but all they like went under or stopped hosting. So I had to like shift shift everything over to some other website and like people write me all the time on the web and on for they go to Banal America they can't find the show anymore and it's just like everything's chaotic it's a mess it's funny cuz we run uh, on on Paratopia we ran cyber ears ads cuz they gave us you know a ridiculous deal yeah constantly so i i keep those in there cuz i'm not going to edit those out to re-release these old paratopias right right but then i saw that they went out of business and i'm like oh this is even funnier <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah so Oops. you know i think it's just yeah so no i don't think being more skeptical about things hurt the audience i i, I think it, i think i would like to think the people that still listen have a healthy respect or at least understand that i have a healthy respect for them where it's like look i'm not gonna insult my listeners by um you know get being like oh this disclosure thing could really happen this time guys it's like now let's just get serious I kind of like to, I treat all my listeners as if they're on the same level as I am as far as stuff they've seen and experienced and know, um, you know, up until now. So, hmm. uh, the, the other sort of, uh, I guess, um, I don't know, the interesting sort of trek that you've made, it seems like we've, when we've talked about before, like you came into this because you were way into the disclosure stuff. And then well, became sort of jaded far. to it. <laughs> no, no, you were way into it. You were like right up the ass of Stephen Greer, if I remember correctly. <laughs> no, what happened was I was a big Coast to Coast fan. I am a big Coast to Coast fan. How could I not be, right? Um, so, but I was, I was really like into it um, and sort of reading, listening to it all the time and everything. It was like really into it and kind of. I was on Steve, I, I taped up an All of America show actually last night with Steve Berg and we were kind of talking about this where it was like when I first got into this, back into it after being in, out of it from in college or whatever, it was like, oh, well, it, I was under the false impression because I hadn't been following UFO research or whatever. And it was just like, oh, they're going to have like a big convention in Washington, D.C. and they're going to have a national press club, press conference. Like, boy, they must be really close to getting to the bottom. They're going to be really close to this UFO thing breaking open because I had no idea in a way it's kind of like probably the people who get mixed up in it after the New York Times article were who were like boy they oh uh, UFOs what they're really close to breaking breaking this open so I was kind of like under the impression that 
the UFO community had like gotten their shit together and that like, it was a fait accompli and this was going to happen at any moment. And they, the disclosure people made a lot of promises like that, but that, that really, it, it was kind of obvious within a few, like within a year or so that that simply wasn't the case. Um, hmm. And I'm sure that contributed to sort of my jadedness afterwards where it was just like, oh man, you know, I got kind of sold a, a fake bill of goods here on this UFO disclosure thing. So, you know, it, it, it helped me. It made me a little more jaded, which I think is a good thing um, when you're dealing with the UFO phenomenon, for sure. Yeah. So you start, is it fair to say then that you started off primarily caring about UFO phenomena? Because then when you do your show, you've got right. to incorporate all this other stuff. Do you know about all this other stuff or are you just learning it as you go along? Um. Kind of learning it as I go along with a base knowledge from uh, listening to Coast to Coast. I listened to Coast to Coast for like three or two or three years, probably before I launched Been All America. So that gave me like a base understanding of the various mysteries and genres and topics and stuff in in the world of the paranormal. And then, yeah, when I first, I was really heavily into UFOs when I first started out. And then it was just like, well, I've talked to everybody I could talk to in UFOs and nothing's changed. And like people who aren't, from that era, from like the turn of the century, um, they may not recall that like the UFO subject was like dead, like dead, dead, dead for like 10 or 15 years till that New York Times article came out. It was really nothing really of, of much excitement ever happened. Um, so eventually I just kind of moved on to other topics and stuff. I always liked Bigfoot as a kid. So that was kind of my Bigfoot and UFO was like my two big things. And then it was like, as I got more into it, and started doing the show more and the show evolved. It was like, I kind of envisioned it in all of America is almost like an encyclopedia Britannica of like the paranormal where it's like, I want to, I want to cover every topic I possibly can over the years. Uh, you know, so, um, you know, I don't know if I'll ever actually f- stop podcasting, but it's certainly like, I can look back now and it's like, I've done just about every topic you can think of in the paranormal. And if I haven't, I'm, I'm hoping to do it at some point. Is there anything you've done that you think isn't true now? Like you've, you've examined it enough and you're like, mm, nah, nothing there. Um, well, you know, I'm more skeptical about, I guess I'm more skeptical of the idea that like beings from other, other planets are like coming here to visit us. Like, I think if anything, they're probably like robots. If there's any kind of being in, in the craft, cause like, how could they function in the gravity difference? that was kind of one of those mind blowing things where it was like, Oh wow. I never thought of that. But like, yeah, if like if if we flew up to Mars or whatever, and just got out of the craft willy nilly, we'd be like, our bones would like crush or whatever. So it's like, um, so that kind of thing has made me question it. I think I just find myself with more questions than answers. Like when you first get into this, uh, there's sort of your straightforward, like Bigfoot's like a lost ape that no one's found yet. And then, then as you get into it more, it's like, well, maybe it might be like some supernatural being or some kind of thought projection or whatever. It gets things, all this stuff gets more complex um, as you look into it more because so many other people have looked into it and they've offered their own theories. And you, the next thing you know, there's like four or five different possibilities for like a lot of this stuff. Ghosts is it? you know, someone, is it someone from uh, the other side coming to visit? Is it like energy that's trapped in a cycle? Is it both? Is it, you know what I mean? So, yeah. Yeah. But I can't think of anything specifically. I mean, yeah, I can't think of anything specifically where I'm like, Oh, I thought that was real. And now I don't anymore. Cause it's just kind of like, I don't know what's real anyway. <laughs> you know, like I don't have an opinion on what UFOs are. I don't really have an opinion on what Bigfoot is. So I can't really say um, that I've changed my mind on it. I guess the only one, <laughs> the Elvis death hoax, maybe, because, uh, <laughs> you know, it would have to come have to have been solved by now. Elvis would be like a hundred and something years old. So it would be, if he hoaxed his death, he's definitely dead now. True. Going back to the UFO thing, though, that were aliens, you know, getting out and difference in gravity and all that. Um, the alien nuts and bolts person would, I am certain, say to that, well, but they're advanced. Can that, well, but they're advanced and we can't know what they've got and what they're capable of? Is there a limit to how far that can go as a rationalization for the high strangeness factors or just even the basic physics factors that you're talking about? Yeah, that's, that's, I'm sure that's kind of their argument. Um, But to me, it's just part of the problem with that idea is 
Like, I get they're really super advanced in the hypothetical sense, but he, it's, they're also, like, super sleek. You know, they're they're not like you put a human if you somehow landed a craft on the surface of Venus and a person got out, they'd have to be wearing. You've seen the astronauts in their spacesuits; they're wearing these insanely clunky things. So, so they would. I suppose if they can travel all the way across space and time, then they must be able to somehow take the technology needed to breathe the air. We don't even know what air they have on their world. Right, uh, we don't know the gravity on their world, so but somehow they've managed to figure all that out and put it all in uh, a super sleek, like pro wrestling style singlet tight <laughs> spandex thing. You know, there's no, there's really almost never any buttons or anything or breathing apparatus or any of that stuff. It's just like they just come rolling out and they're fine. So, I mean, it's sure, I suppose, but it stretches believability to me in a sense um just on a basic biological level uh that's why i am in favor of the robot idea which i think is perfectly reasonable in a sense um that they would send robots as it sentient robots or something like Mm. that Um, that's entirely possible then they don't have to worry about breathing and i don't know if how the how the gravity would affect them or anything like that what if they sent sentient robots who are here now subtly programming us to create sentient robots so that they can go back to their masters with an army of sentient robots that are completely out of their control and take over their own world. That's entirely possible. I heard an interesting theory that somehow the, somehow the internet was like, was their Trojan horse. Oh, really? To completely disrupt the human race somehow, human condition by, fracturing us into these little uh, pockets of reality or something like that. Because yeah, we can't take speculate. responsibility for ourselves. That's basically no, what that we is. Didn't, yes. We didn't build the pyramids and we didn't invent the internet. Right. We didn't. We don't do we anything. Are. We're just we're just hapless. We're one big psyop and there's nobody in charge. Exactly. Uh, so going further down the Tim Banal rabbit hole, you go from podcasting to, I mean... In the last couple of years, you're sort of a man sojourning, it seems to me, just from like your tweets and stuff. Like you're going, you're hosting uh, con- paranormal conferences, you're a guest speaker at paranormal conferences, and you're just a member in the audience of paranormal conferences. And it seems like you do a yeah. lot of that going around stuff. And I'm wondering, in doing that, and I'm assuming at these conferences, you sp- probably speak to people, interested public, and also researchers. Are there any researchers, people who classify themselves as researchers of the unknown uh, who you think in their specialty, if it's Bigfoot, UFOs, whatever it is, um, do you think any one specialty um, attracts a person who calls himself a researcher who's actually more qualified to be a researcher than any other genre? I don't... Maybe UFOs, maybe, because, like, I don't necessarily know what would qualify someone to be a ghost hunter, so we can kind of knock that one right out, (laughs) right? I don't, like, there's not, like, a college degree where I'd be like, we're going to hunt ghosts, we need a guy who has a degree in X to join the team, Um, and with Bigfoot, I suppose it's sort of uh, cryptozoology in general. Maybe like someone with a zoological background. At the very least, in ufology, you get people that are kind of tangentially related to things that fly in the sky, like pilots and <laughs> aerospace type characters and military type people that, um, you know, the UFOs are kind of tangentially related to military in a sense, especially nowadays. So it's that might be where you find the most qualified. I'm stretching that quite a bit. Um, experts or researchers if you will um but i also feel and i mean this with all due respect but i feel like the whole paranormal is sort of geared toward the diy personality um if someone was an eminently qualified zoologist chances are they'd be in zoology so not working on hunting sasquatch or maybe on the side they do it a little bit or something like that but it's generally it seems like 
Um, you get a lot of people that are so they're arm they're armchair researchers, they're armchair experts who are self educated. It's just a, the whole that the whole paranormal is very DIY, um, and that's just the nature of of the beast uh, in a way. Now, at least with UFOs, you see some academics getting mixed up in it, but they. I'm not a big fan of academic ufology as it's constituted nowadays because it's a lot of people arguing about how many aliens can dance on the head of a pin. And to me, it just doesn't make, doesn't really make a difference. Um, but yeah, I think this is the DIY nature of the paranormal that precludes in a sense, um, anyone who is like super qualified to be covering the topics. And again, that's not like a slam on, on, anyone really and it's just sort of the circumstances of the situation like for example you can look at james e mcdonald like he is someone who we who i would say was eminently qualified he was the guy he was great that's why he's held in such high regard because stan friedman nuclear physics like if he had any sort of credentials you were already like one of the preeminent people in the field because most of the people didn't have the kind of credentials that could get them taken seriously by uh you know the mainstream hmm. what about in terms of alleged experiencers you've spoken to was there any one group if it's i don't know ufos ghosts aliens bigfoot is there any one type of experiencer who you've talked to enough to be like mm, I, my my sniff test is higher for this category than another um, not really. I don't have a particular interest in the experiencer phenomenon per se. I just, I enjoy hearing the stories when I do hear them, but I don't really seek them out. Um, there's not much I can do with them. I find myself, if I find myself feeling bad in a way where it's like, I don't want to be skeptical, but you get, I'm inherently skeptical, but this person says that this happened to them. And I hate that expression, but like, I believe that you believe that this happened. It's kind of like that where I try not to judge uh, people's experiences. That's what they say, but there's like really not much I can do with it. And, and, and I, I find myself almost, like I said, I feel kind of bad and I feel in a way where my natural inclination is to like poke holes in the story. Not necessarily that I don't believe them, but I, but I'm trying to like figure out how to rationalize this story. So it's like, well, how did, how did the, you know, how did you get pulled through the wall of the house? How do you think that happened? You know what I mean? That kind of thing. And they don't have an answer for it either. So it's just kind of, so I feel like maybe I, I unintentionally undermine their experiences, but that's not my, my purpose or my, my reasoning. It's just sort of, I, I'm trying to wrap my head around these fantastic tales. Um, and very often it's, it, it's, I'm kind of just left reaching. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, famously, ufology has had its good number of frauds. Um, but I remember taking part in a conference that you were hosting where the guy sitting next to me who claimed to have a Bigfoot track or something had this story about Bigfoot. It, it turned out that he was lying. Um, so I'm just wondering if if that jades you in any way, like toward Bigfoot people <laughs> in general who have a story or toward <laughs> ufology people in general when it turns out, oh, they're frauds too. Like, there, this, there's, I guess there's plenty of frauds to go around, so how can you judge everyone by the same broad stroke is kind of, maybe that's right. the, maybe that's the simple answer. I mean, I yeah, it's, yeah, and it's not just like you, yeah, like you were saying, I mean, there are people in the Bigfoot community who claim, like, that Bigfoot comes, like, lives on their property and they have, like, a copacetic relationship with Bigfoot. It's like, well, then, Take a fucking picture of it. Well, let me put like, it to you this way. How about this? Let me ask it this way. <laughs> like, I don't remember. I think the guy who had the Bigfoot print and who claimed he saw Bigfoot, it was just like a one-off, right? He wasn't like, oh, Bigfoot lives on my property and, oh, there, it's a cosmic thing. He turned invisible and left or anything like that. So yeah. basically treats Bigfoot like an animal. Would you be more or less willing to believe someone who had a story like that with supposed evidence of Bigfoot being an animal that they saw in the woods um, just coincidentally won the lottery, as opposed to it being like part of some larger tapestry of high strangeness in this person's life. You know what I mean? Like, would one ring more true than the other? Because one is like so fantastical, and yet if they're living a fantastical life, it fits a pattern. And the other one is like, 
I was in the woods and I saw Bigfoot and no one else ever sees Bigfoot in the woods ever there. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that almost more fantastical? I don't know. I'm I, just asking. Is that more fantastical or is that the same it's fantastical? An interesting, it's an interesting conundrum. On the one side, the, the person who sees the Bigfoot and in their yard or whatever, and they think it's just an animal. That's cool to me because I can kind of like at least wrap my head around that a little bit where it's like, okay, I, I have deer that go through my backyard. So I kind of like, all right, well, animals do come out of the woods sometimes and, you know, show themselves and then take off and go back into the woods pretty, pretty quickly if you make any noise. Um, but to me, in a sense, even though I find myself skeptical very often, it's a lot, the, other, just the other version that you're telling, it sounds a lot more fun. And I'm all about fun. And so if someone's like, I have Bigfoot that comes through my property all the time. And I'm also an abductee. And, and there's, and there's also like a spirit in my house. It's like, wow, you've got a lot going on. And I kind of like, that would be someone I would be interested in talking to because they have a lot of wild stuff happening. Um, but I, I don't know necessarily if I would believe them. Cause to me, it would be like, well, you got to document this or else I can't really, um, but to me, it's just like not about believing anymore. It's like, what what difference does it make if I believe them or not? Um, I kind of just want to listen in a sense, uh, in a situation like that. Hmm. Um, so this being a Jeff special and all, maybe I'll just ask you, we're, we're going to concentrate, yes. or I'm going to concentrate heavily on, in this one, on his Shroud Man stuff. You know, that shrouded guy who came to him and had like sit down chats. Because yeah. there were a couple of things that he never that Jeff wouldn't say on the show, that he was told he could say on the show, but he didn't want to. <laughs> because they sounded, one, fantastical, and the other, too much like an answer that, if people believed it, might be not good for them in some way. So, that kind of cautiousness... Are you at liberty to reveal these things? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll probably have revealed them by the time we... So, the first one was, um, he had asked the Shroud Man what he was and he had said I'm an Alad and he asked him why he was here and uh and he now he was not going to sit Jeff the reason Jeff wasn't going to tell anyone that was because hey, that sounds like a contactee bullshit right like I'm in a lod what's an Alad right <laughs> uh, who that? knows I mean oh, it sounds okay. like so Aladdin or Allah right. or something but it, it sounds like you know I am Valiant okay. Thor right. you know like no one. Right, right, right. Okay. He loses all credibility if I didn't he says know if I was that out loud. To know what that meant. No, no, no. Just the ridiculous. I was waiting for the ridiculousness of it to sit in. But then he said uh, that the reason that they were here was, um, well, not that the reason they were here, but one of the things that they were watching us for is that there is a singularity coming, and for their people, it was sort of a transcendental event, but they don't know how we're going to react. And at the time, I didn't I didn't realize singularity was associated with AI. I just thought singularity meant like a black hole. I was like, oh, is there a black hole coming? Um, so, but he didn't want to put that out there just in case people got too hung up on it and it became, you know, fear. <laughs> Shit, there's a singularity coming and what's yeah. going to happen? Um, why am I telling you this? Oh, because you asked. <laughs> I don't know. You were setting up a question. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, I was going to ask you, were you familiar, first of all, with the Shroud Man stuff? Did Jeff ever talk to you about that personally, or did you know about it through any I didn't really anyway? talk about it, and I'd only kind of heard about it tangentially through the show, but only on occasion. I don't think I really uh, did. I don't know if I caught any of, like, the deep dives when you guys went into it, so I'm kind of... So feeling my way through this. Have you ever heard of anything like that um, with any of your guests in terms of they have experiences that I mean, Jeff had a broad swath of experiences. But when it came to the so-called alien, it was the alien, right, that we all know and love the gray, the yeah. whatever. And then it changes to out of that confusion to literal sit down chats of clarity with this being with the caveat that it still may or may not be true, <laughs> but it's seemingly there's clarity. Right. Seemingly all of this is happening. Have you heard of anything like that? Um, well, I'll just ask you that first. Have you heard anything like that with your guests? Certainly not on like a recurring basis. Not for many of my guests. No. 
No, that's a wholly unique experience, I think. Well, uh, for for Jeff at least, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't I don't recall anyone ever sort of having a recurring visitation experience like that. That that was on in all of America at least. Huh. Okay. It's very interesting the singularity thing, though. I don't know if necessarily you mentioned the. I don't know what a singularity is per se. Is it just? Is it? How would you define that? Well, see, I thought again. I thought a singularity because it refer it refers to a black hole, but it also refers to the merging of humanity with technology. You know, the coming together. Okay, they call All that right. the singularity. So now it's like, oh, is that what this is? There's a part of me. <laughs> I don't know if this would qualify as a singularity. But there's a part of, for there's part of me wonders sometimes, like especially this year. Um, I think maybe this whole environment thing's a lot worse than the, than we even think. Um, <laughs> this summer was really bad and really weird, and I think like I think we I think we're maybe like twenty years ahead of where people think we are going to be, you know, the public at least. You know what I mean? And I, mm-hmm. I fear that this summer was like a, a glimpse of what the new normal is going to be. This really erratic, crazy weather getting worse and worse and worse. And, and the stuff that we imagined would be happening 20 years from now is actually going to be happening in two years from now. Um, and so maybe that's why you see a lot of freakouts like with the UFO stuff per se. And just, just generally, people are freaking out. People just are really kind of on edge and, and just strange. And, and so, um, you know, I think that sometimes a lot of the stuff, the UFOs, the AI stuff, I sometimes wonder if that's just all a big distraction because they're like, well, they feel don't know that in five years, a lot of the planet's just going to be uninhabitable. So we'll just let them be distracted by all this stuff and slowly get used to the idea that things are going to just keep getting worse. And, you know, the whole thing with the water temperatures off of Florida getting up to like 90 degrees, that was kind of the wake up, the wake up call for me it was like, wait a minute, if the oceans start boiling, um, this is not good. This is going to throw every, it's going to be a tipping point here where it's just going to complete chaos. Yeah, well, I guess I see that similar, but I, I still, again, I come back to our our own r- responsibility in this. Like, I don't think I don't think there's a cabal of people trying to promote distractions. I think we're into these as distractions because we don't want to deal with global oh, yeah, warming sure. and the fact that it's us doing this, and we want that savior right, or right, we want right. that controllable, you know, entity that is an enemy that we can focus on. Yeah, focus on something else or pray to a savior, and also, you know. Sort of another wackiness that's I'm seeing coming down the pike here real soon in ufology land, at least, is the David Grush thing where, you know, David Grush comes out and he, he, he talks to Congress and all that. And it seems like on UFO Twitter or X Twitter, whatever the hell it's called now, uh, people were like, <laughs> oh, you know, humanity, we have to prepare the non-believers for the ontological shock that's coming. And now I'm seeing that because the David Grush thing has come and gone, they're all depressed. Like, they've got their own ontological shock to deal with because, you know, it's always a projection. Right, right, right. right. And, and like, so there is this pseudo-documentary, you know, Spending Seven Days with David Grush, that seems to me just a rehash of the same thing we just saw a few weeks ago. Yeah, didn't we just see this? They just put a different name on it. But anyway, but I see like the responses to that from the believers is like, oh, thank God, this gives me hope. Like they need some other further gem. Like they're not really in this because they think they see a mystery and they want to engage the mystery and figure it out. They see like saviors in the sky and like some story that they can be a part of, you know, a role playing game or whatever. And they don't realize it. That to me is going to seems like it has the potential to come to roost at some point where like, yeah, they've been given all of these promises And all of this stuff, and, you know, in the olden days, you could just, you know, if you fell out of love with ufology because you were given too many promises, you could just go away because it's bullshit. Or you could go deeper down a rabbit hole or whatever. But now, like you're saying, like, I think we have so much existential crisis going on that one more thing could put 
certain people over the edge to, you know, kill themselves, do whatever, you know, whatever, however, whatever awful thing it is that right, people right. do in response. Do you like that to me? This this searching for meaning without saying that that's what you're doing by pretending that you're not searching for meaning, you're pretending that you want answers from the government for aliens. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is there, I, I don't know, is there anything that one, you and I must do about that or speak to about that? Or do we, is it an impossible situation and who cares anyway, they're going to do what they're going to do? It's an impossible situation. We've done our part. We tried to warn these people. We tried to tell them that this is a recurring cycle of promises made and promises broken. Um, and it's on them to live and learn. And I hope that no one does anything stupid as a result of it. I think that partially, I wonder, again, not to get too political, but it was like, it seems like it's a very right issue. Uh, Tucker was sort of the big champion of this before he got mercifully fired by Fox News. Not like they're any better at now. Um, but there wasn't, I, I kind of was in agreement in a sense with a lot of people who expressed caution that, you know, the idea, I think these people could get folded in to sort of a, maybe not sort of an anti-government sect of the public, if you will. Uh, maybe not so far as like QAnon, but close to it, or just anti, you know, deep state kind of thing. And um, the, the whole idea sort of with the Tucker thing was like, well, Tucker's the only one telling us the truth about the aliens. So maybe he's telling us the truth about these people crossing the border in droves and 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 uh, all this other crazy, you know, bigoted and, and racist stuff that he pushed. So it's like, I, I fear that maybe those people become disillusioned and become absorbed into that mindset, which is troubling as it is, but we've already got a split country. There's already a shitload of people absorbed into that mindset. So I don't know if, I don't know if, you know, maybe the UFO people will, will be their downfall once the UFO people show up and <laughs> You're right. they're like, they'll be like, ah, this has gone a little too far now. All right. Now that we've got the guy <laughs> who thinks that there are beings visiting from Orthon, maybe we need to rethink our stance on the border. Um, but I mean, yeah, it's, it's a, there is sort of like a, an existential thing. You make a great point where it's these people that if they could admit they're searching for meaning and not that they're trying to, to actually get the government to tell them the truth about aliens. To me, it's always like, I would love, and I, now that Good All America is close to being up and running again, maybe I'll get one of these folks on the show, but it's like, they never talk about what the fuck's going to happen after disclosure. I know Rich Dolan wrote a book about it like 15 years ago. That's completely <laughs> moved at this point. Now, 15 years ago was like, that was a whole different world. But it's like, if the government comes out and says tomorrow, okay, aliens are real. You all still got to go to your jobs and everything. If you're looking for salvation in the revelation, you're not going to find it. And it stuns me that anyone might even have that mindset, but I think a lot of people do. And it's unfortunate because you still got to go to work. You're still going to have to pay your bills. The government's not going to be like, Oh, there's aliens are real. And also here's free energy for everyone. And also the cure for cancer because the aliens gave it to us, but we didn't want to tell you about that either, but I guess we have to now. It's like, no man, nothing's going to change. Jack Brewer, our mutual friend, Jack Brewer makes a great point where, Oh, for so long, there was this idea that, oh, we can't tell the public about UFOs and aliens because they'll freak out. And it's like, the more I think about it, it's kind of from talking to Jack and Jack kind of brought this up. It's like, the people that are going to freak out are the UFO people. <laughs> Everyone else is going to be like, oh, okay, aliens, that's cool. Um, all right. Like, that's, I didn't give it much thought and I still have to go to work tomorrow. And great, aliens, awesome. UFOs are real, cool. Um, uh, you know, who's going to win the football game on Sunday? The UFO people. This will not be the grand moment for you. This will not be the life-changing experience that you think it will be. Um, I'm sorry. I just don't, I don't believe that. Even if aliens are real, even if the government comes out and says aliens are real, it will not be the, this, this paradigm shifting thing. I just don't, I don't really. Believe well, and that. what, what is, um, what is supposed to be the shift? Because like, do you suddenly uh get trained to be on the the hollow deck of the enterprise like what right, is it exactly. that they 
what do they think they're qualified to do in a in a higher higher it's, consciousness world, <laughs> higher intelligence world? When you're trapped in your fucking mom's basement, you're on the spectrum, and you know you're eating ho hos and trolling people for for fun. Like, <laughs> what, exactly. what's your fucking the place on the like, Enterprise? <laughs> There's a part of the significant portion of the country, which I am not a part of. There's a significant portion of the country who don't want anyone coming here. So, so, so unless they're from Denmark, right? Unless they're, unless they're, unless they're white, blue eyed hair, blue eyed, blonde haired people, right? And so, like, look at the government says the, the aliens, they're not, where the fuck are we going to have the aliens? Where are they going to live? They're not just going to integrate into our society. There seems to be this really fucked up idea. That like, oh, the government's going to say aliens are real. And now, oh, we'll just all live together and shit. It's like, that, hey, that shit takes time. Like, he's going to, people are going to freak out if like a bunch of ships roll in. Look at, I know you don't like it. Look at District 9, right? It's like, people are not going to handle the arrival of a sentient beings to share the planet with us. That will not go well. <laughs> uh, we're not going to integrate and become a part of the Galactic Federation and all of a sudden, uh, you can just leave and go to some other world and everything. But see, that's what it is. Great, it, no. It's heaven. It, it really is like they don't realize yeah, it, but their insane. vision is heaven. Like you don't know what comes next. You die and go to heaven. And then what? It, 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 like, but your sense right. of at least with heaven and then what is like, I'm dead. I don't have to know. I don't have to do anything. I have no responsibilities. It's just greatness and it feels yeah. good and whatever. But with the alien disclosure, it's like, well, no, there's actually something that's going to happen after if society doesn't go on as normal, there's going to be new jobs or what, however you want to frame that. You know, are you an engineer? Like, how are right. you prepared to be in that world? Are you qualified <laughs> yeah. to to exactly. fix a, yeah. a, a teleporter device or something? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, look, if they have lady footlockers on Jupiter, you're in luck. Maybe <laughs> Yes. But I don't see how you're qualified to, to work to work with the aliens. Exactly. It's like no, I don't the aliens don't need shit posters and trolls. They're, they're enlightened beings who can travel through space and time. We we are like we're animals to these to these beings if if they're just, you know, aliens from another world or whatever. What if they do so, need yeah, shit posters? That's the and other trolls. part. <laughs> Well, we're in luck. We got a lot of those. Um, yeah, no, it's crazy. It's just crazy. Uh, yeah, I don't know what people think. And the whole idea that, like, look, sure, it's gratifying to be right and everything, but how the fuck long do you think anyone's going to care that you were right about aliens? Like, a week? <laughs> right. A month? Maybe. I bet by the end of the month, your family and friends are going to be fucking tired of you saying I was right about aliens. It's like, okay, dude, you're right. Like, we all get it. We We've all moved on. The aliens are real. So, like, it's that super grass. It's like when your sports team wins the World Series. It only lasts for, like, a week, dude. Yeah. And that, that's it. So, can you imagine? I don't... Some of these people on there, like on X or Twitter, I, uh, you know, they'll, they just... Their whole thing is this shit. And it's like, this is unhealthy, dude. And you go on their bio, and it's like UAP activists and... Uh, UFO Brotherhood and every single thing is UFOs. It's like, man, you're investing a lot into something that A, could never happen, and B, if it happens, is not going to be what you think it brings with it as far as some transcendent life altering experience for you. You still got to raise your kids, you still got to pay your mortgage. Um, and chances are, we're not going to be integrating with aliens in some some super society anytime soon. So even if they are yeah. real. Well, as you said, you know, we, we don't even really want to be integrated with ourselves, you know, like, exactly. we can't yeah. even, we I, can't I, even I get real with like whether or not animals have self-consciousness or if we're okay to just kick them down the street, you know, like, but we're ready for yeah, advanced no, aliens. I mean, <laughs> yeah. It's like, look, the, the writer in me, the quasi journalist in me, the, the, the just, person who loves Kate. Yes, I would love disclosure. I would love to see what happens. Love to see how crazy this gets. But like as a, a responsible human being, I feel like I'm probably anti-disclosure because I don't think 
I, I liken it to the COVID thing. COVID was the disclosure test, and we failed the disclosure test. It was like, look, this thing came out of nowhere. We don't know anything about it. People are dying. We all need to get together and figure this out. It's kind of like the whole thing. Well, if aliens arrived, then we'd all get together. Well, look, an alien did arrive. It was called COVID. And we should have gotten together, but instead we split apart in like a violent, insane fashion where people died um, because they just couldn't listen to common sense. And they still, uh, as I said, kind of like you were saying earlier, like do people stop listening? I'm sure there are probably maybe some people in your audience listening now who are like, oh, it was all a hoax. And blah, blah, blah. It's like, dude, people died. People died needlessly because they didn't want to listen to reason and, and work together and band together in the face of the alien invasion. So what, what the fuck do you think we're going to do if aliens come along? God forbid people die from aliens. Right. Um, and then I guess just sticking with this for one more second, um, the, the, there is that yeah. sort of, I don't know, fear is the right word, but suspicion that like, oh, well, now that the government has co-opted UFOs for whatever PSYOP or whatever it is that they're doing with this, um, yeah, they're going to yeah. do the same with abductions. Do you think that that, one, do you think that's possible? Um, and two, what would be the point? Like, I could see the point of UFOs. I can see the point of getting us confused with foreign technology and, and aliens and, and perpetual funding for perpetual war against things that don't exist. Like, I, I get well, all the sort of practical, like, money-making schemes that could possibly be associated with that. I can't see what the point would be in giving legitimacy and changing the terminology to a militaristic one for alien abductions. Can you? Uh, well, when this all started, like in 2017, there was talk, I think it was, uh, Gary Nolan. I think he was like talking about looking at the brains of people who had ET contact experiences. Um, I thought that was going on or the, or that was part of the, what the, what the government group that Harry Reid sponsored. I think that was part of what they were looking at. And, um, excuse me. Um, I always thought that the end game of that was and let's say that if the abduction experience even if it isn't a, the other coming and interacting with us maybe it's just some kind of brain chemistry thing but it's a good thing it's like a transcendent mind altering thing like an ayahuasca trip or something like that right that your brain can do on its own under certain circumstances and it's a good thing it opens up your mind and and it's a uh, it speeds up your own personal evolution and maybe they don't like that maybe the powers that be don't like that so if they were to co-opt it, I think it would be in a way where they would be like, oh, we figured out why this is happening because you have a genetic um, deficiency here or genetic tweak that happened. Um, and so we got a pill for you. We got a pill. This will stop the experiences that you're happening. You you know, you won't. These, these things aren't real. Don't worry. It turns out that it's a genetic thing. It's a brain chemistry thing. And we figured out and there's a pill to like put a stop to it. So if anything, you would see if, if they, if they co-opted abductions, I think it would be to tamp down on that mind altering evolutionary sort of experience um, in a sense, because they don't, they, they don't, they just want us kind of dumb and, and, and dopey and, and knocked out and not really thinking about all this stuff. That's how, if they, if they wanted to co-opt it, I think that would be why. Yeah. I guess it just seems harder to me because, um, abductions are harder to put in an alien bottle, you know? Like, as, as easy as it is to put UFOs right, into right. alien technology, it's a lot harder to see alien abduction, especially once you get rid of the hypnosis testimony. You know, like... Yeah. <laughs> it's a little more airy-fairy than that, but... um, Yeah, well, I don't necessarily even mean the government in a sense. Maybe academia could would be co-opting it. Huh. Like, uh, well, it's okay for us to look at UFOs, so now let's take a look at the abduction oh, people and see if we can figure out what's really going on with them. And then, you know, it's kind of the whole scene, the whole UFO scenes being co-opted by the government. It's very interesting in a way, just that it's the only cases that matter, are the ones that are officially government sanctioned now <laughs> right. like, where we've really gone so far off the UFO reservation that I think that's partially why a lot of us old timers don't really have much interest in it. Cause the, the only ones, the only cases that are, 
that qualify as important or they all come from military jets and only the weird ones are the ones that are important. It's like, well, what about the fucking guy who got the pancakes or, (laughs) or, or all these other, what about the Pascagoula guys? Like what about what happened with them? And what about Flatwoods? And what about all the crazy, there's tons of crazy UFO stories um, that, that, that happened to the public that are far more interesting than a blob that uh Navy pilots saw. Um, yeah. So it's kind of a bummer. UFOs aren't the government UFOs are boring. Well, and again, it, like it, it gets to like, they are reconditioning us. You know, if you want a real psyop in this, that is it. I don't know to what, for what reason, but um, I just saw a guy being interviewed recently about the Pentagon and how they, do their terminology. So like, like the department of defense used to be the department of war <laughs> until it became like, yeah, mm, yeah. we should call that the department of defense. And it's like, well, they haven't really defended a whole lot as much as they've gone to war and promoted wars and stuff like that. So they do things like that. And so changing UFO to UAP and changing, like you're saying, everything is just Navy pilots at this point or air force pilots and the Navy. Right. right. Um, it, they are putting it into a box and pretending to be on board with well they're pretending like this is new to them and that they're on board with sharing right like all these you know from yeah. nasa to whatever the grush run thing was uh a tip or whatever yeah. the fuck i don't know um I mean, all of that is a lie, and yet we are so willing to play into it. The very people who said, you know, you, you can't trust the government, you can't trust the military. Eh, eh, eh. Yeah, it's frustrating. The second they become a whistleblower to the thing you suspect, it game on. It's just so weird. And, yeah, and the funny part is is that the that they like the – and it's not we. we we're, we're, we're hip to the game. It's the UFO – I call it the UAP crowd. If they want to, they want to fucking have that. They can have it. They're the UAP crowd. We're the UFO people, um, but they're the UAP people, and that's fine. That's that could be their scene, and they're all about the government. They're and the funny part is, is they only like you're saying they love David Grush. They love the people that testify before Congress. They hate the Kirkpatrick guy that's working for the DOD who says it's not aliens. They hate the Pentagon spokeslady Susan Go. They they don't like her at all. They're they're part of the CIA. I don't know if you saw the NASA coverage where NASA was like, "Look, yeah, we did what you wanted. We assembled a panel of experts, and they're looking at the thing. And all you guys did was bombard them with threats and and hatred to the point that we we're we're calling you out. We're calling you out. Let's, please stop threatening and harassing." our panel of UFO experts to the point where we don't even want to release the name of our new leader. <laughs> yeah. Right. We'll disclose everything, but the names of the people involved because you fucking lunatics will show up at our door. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's really kind of funny in a way. It's it, ufology has no one uh, like, kind of like what I was saying with Jackson, like the people who can't handle it are the UFO people. <laughs> Everyone else is kind of like, all right, let's see what they get. Let's see what they can find out. Uh, But the UFO people, they want their aliens. But isn't this par for the course? If you're going to move this into the military realm and into the political realm, and the politics of the day uh, is like the right-wing lunacy bullying anger people, then, you know, like people would never show up at your door in the old days of ufology. You wouldn't have a threat on your life, you know, at NASA or anywhere. And now it's like par for the course. So... That's par for the course. Like, you know, and again, getting back to the look in the mirror moment, if this is what we are and we're the ones demanding disclosure, you know, (laughs) angry, violent people um, suckered into, you know, this obvious like sham for whatever reason. It's a it's a sham. Yeah. Um, Maybe aliens uh, probably should just stay in the shadows. You know, maybe we don't deserve the yeah. disclosure yeah. we think we we're entitled to. Well, it's interesting. You may I, I haven't really been following it super closely, sort of the discourse, if you will. I follow the news, but it's yeah. I mean, look, it's telling that I think somebody pointed out today it was like twelve weeks ago that the Grush story broke. That's like three months, and this guy says we have alien bodies and shit. 
like it shouldn't take three months for if that's true for it to come out. I, I don't see what to me that's like it, when the story dies on the vine like that. It's a pretty good indication that we probably don't have alien like there's something not quite right with this whole thing. Yeah. So I can see how they'd be despondent about it, but I don't know. There's something very interesting going on. I mean, I won't lie, but I'm kind of invested in the soap opera aspect of it. Not so much whether we're going to find out about aliens or not, but just like they shot the balloons down in February. And part of me was like, well, that's it. This is it. They're going to say that this is the UFOs. We've been, you've asked us to look at, we figured it out. You know, they're giant, they're different balloons. And now we'll, we can tell you that. And we need to get serious about these balloons and the spy equipment and everything. And I was like, all right, it's game over. And it seemed like that for a few months. Then all of a sudden this Grouch thing came out, came along. So it's like, I wonder if there's some kind of like factional war going on between different parties who are trying to advance some kind of agenda. Um, you know, to what end? I have no idea. Because it's interesting. They're pushing it as far as they can to the, the alien disclosure part. But I don't think they're going to get it. So I don't know how, what the where the rubber's going to hit the road here. Like how many you had a congressional hearing where a guy claims that we have downed alien ships and alien bodies. It's like where can you go from here? Like how much further can you push this narrative without producing something of no? And I think eventually it's been six years now since that article came out in the New York Times. I think I I I think the government I think the public is is getting a little disclosure fatigue yeah i say all the time show me the fucking aliens like i've had enough of this some guy told me this and i heard from that guy and now you know a guy who saw a thing it's like look enough already it's all talk until you pull out an alien and show it to me then that's disclosure and i don't mean uh high man saw god bless him at least he showed us the aliens <laughs> even, though they, even though they were like paper mache <laughs> he showed us the cake um well yeah that's the kind of thing i'm that's what i'm holding out for i want to say that's uh, your kind of disclosure like that's your favorite kind of disclosure yeah yeah um, i like a circus so jeff of course famously uh was constantly threatening to leave ufology and be done with this and then eventually sort of did do you think it you know and a lot of that was because of the unseriousness and the preposterous nature of the people looking into it um but since it's become hyper preposterous, uh, I would think you would think um, since 2017. Do you think the hyper preposterousness of it would have drawn him back to where he'd have been so angry that he couldn't stay away? Do you think he would be back at this I point? Think so. I do yeah. too. <laughs> yeah, he's so he's sorely missed. He's sorely missed right now. Um, he's yeah, he's someone who we really could use to to call out bullshit in his unique way. That we just, uh, I mean, there's plenty of people calling out bullshit, but he had a way of doing it that was uh, uniquely his way. And he was sharp and he, he didn't suffer fools or anything. So it would be, I would be really interested to see his take on all this stuff that's happening now. Um, and, and yeah, he's, he, he, it's a, it was a huge loss for the community. It was a loss when he, when he sort of stepped back from ufology. But as we said, when we did the virtual, uh, memorial for him on there. I always assumed he'd be back at some point. It was kind of, we all kind of lose interest for a while and dip out for a little bit. And I always figured he'd, he'd come back around. And I have a feeling for sure that if he was around now, he would be very, he would have a lot of opinions on this stuff and he would want to, um, you know, make them known in a, in a outlet like Paratopia. Um, so yeah, it's a, it was a huge loss for the community and especially now. Um, if nothing was going on in UFOs, it would be one thing, but it's like, it's getting wild and crazy right now. And, and, you know, Jeff's, Jeff's take on it would be priceless. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this. I mean, you know, Jeff and I would always talk about as experiencers, there always does seem to be some sort of, when you want to get out synchronistic event or blatant in your face, paranormal event or something, that would happen, that would draw you back in. Like, you can never leave. You always get suckered back in somehow. Do you feel that as a non-experiencer? Do you feel like part of that rabbit hole? Or has, or could, do you think you can just dip out anytime you want and, and be done? Um, 
Well, I can't dip out because I work every day in the paranormal, so my job is to cover the paranormal. My perspective on it's changed a lot. I have a very antagonistic relationship with the paranormal now where I, I cover it. I need it to perform for me. <laughs> I can't... Uh, I can't wait around. But you don't it's have like, to do Banal of America. You don't have to dive in head first the no, way no, you do. No, I don't do. have to do Banal of America. Right, right, right. No, for sure, for sure. No, I mean, I think you can kind of dip out. And I, I have dipped out of, like, doing the show for a while. And just sort of in the last few months, with a lot, and it kind of, in a way, with the Grush stuff and, and just the zaniness of it all and, and wanting to have a voice and having a place to talk about stuff um, has inspired me to bring back Banal of America. So it's, yeah, I mean, I, 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 even not having my own experiences, uh, I do, I do feel I can dip out and then stuff will happen that'll interest me or I'll reach sort of a critical mass point where it's like, all right, there's like five or six or seven or eight people I really want to talk to you right now. And let's get, let's get the show rolling again, pretty much. So it's kind of, it comes and it goes. Um, it's tough being in this. I think you've been around as long as I, like 20 years. Do you, in a normal interest way or in, like, do you ever have moments where you're like, that's it. I'm done with this. And then like synchronistically, like boom, 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 things happen that you're like, okay, now I'm drawn back in. Like, does that happen for you or no? Um, not that I can put my finger on any specific sort of moment like that. It'll be more just like, all right, I don't have anything that interests me right now. Uh, like what happened in 2019, I've told this story a bunch of times. I don't know. Uh, I don't want to necessarily get into the whole misadventure that I went on. But but like in 2019, I'm like, I'm just so burned out on UFO, of all these topics, that um, on a personal side, I can cover them as news. But like on a personal, like, am I, what, what do I want to invest my time in off the clock? I'm just really not interested in this stuff. And then it was like, well, just... It, strangely somehow it was like I had extra vacation time and there was a flat earth convention. And I'm like, now that sounds interesting. <laughs> like this is, this is weird. This is like another realm of the paranormal that I've never even thought of that I find like really entertaining. And it's like in, insane way. And I just sort of dove head first into that and really immersed myself in that community to try and get a better understanding of, of them and what motivates them and all that stuff. So it's that kind of thing does happen to me more frequently or, or especially uh, I, I sort of always have had like a tangential side thing with true crime. So a lot of that stuff will kind of grab me and pull me in too. So like something else will pull me and pull me in a different direction um, of interest. But a lot of times these things don't, change things just haven't changed much i mean the ufo stuff's simmering like crazy you set that aside but like bigfoot and ghosts and a lot of these mysteries there really isn't much um happening but there's always right. you know something might happen where i might be like i mean i've really been kind of like i don't know what'll become of it but i get these ideas and so very often i'm an idea man i don't do much with them but like i've been kicking around an idea for like a year now and now it's the time when i would sort of pursue it but it's like I have a real interest. I live in a town that's like 225 years old or something like that with no discernible paranormal history whatsoever. And it's like, that's not possible. How is there no ghost stories in this town? So it's kind of it's been percolating in my head. Like I should go on a personal pursuit to find just the paranormal history of this community I live in and try and get to the bottom of like, find our ghost because mm -hmm. our town has no ghost. Um, <laughs> So who knows? That could, that's the kind of thing that, like, next thing you know, you might be talking to me in six months, and I'd be like, I might be like, Vanny, I'm, I'm just doing like fucking a ghost hunt every two weeks. <laughs> these different places. I'm really into ghost hunting. I hope so. That's kind of my personality. Like, I'll, I know it would be cool. I'll just dive into that, and and that'll be my my pursuit for a while, probably until I, you know, find the one building in my town that probably has a ghost. And then I'd be like, all right, I'm done. I found our ghost. So, but that that's just kind of my personality. I mean, I don't think I'll ever leave the paranormal, um, but it'll always be sort of, I'll always be kind of evolving. And, and um, as Bob Dylan says, I'll always be sort of in a constant state of becoming, constantly changing and, and, right. and um, you know, exploring new avenues. Well, Tim, our time is up here in Paratopia, but what will and when will Banal of America be becoming? 
When can we expect this back? This banal of America. Uh, uh, within the month here of October, sometime in October, I've got a few episodes in the can. Um, I've mentioned to a few people, maybe you'll I identify with this. I don't feel like I've lost a step hosting, but I find producing is more difficult than I remember it. People are busier now. Hmm. There's more shows. Um, it's and not so much new people. I have a whole Rolodex of great friends and I could run but all of America from now until probably the middle of next year, just on people who I could get online or pick up the phone and book and we could do shows. That's once, once you have that kind of rapport and the friendship with people, it's easy to book shows with them. As you know, like you texted me like, um, I don't even know, like Friday or Saturday or something. And I'm like, sure, we'll do it whenever you want to do it. But like find getting new people, I find the potential guests are more jaded and busier than that I recall back when we first started, which was like a- anyone, any outlet that would talk to somebody was they'd be willing to do the show. Hmm. Um, that's why, like, if you look back at the beginning of Blood All of America, it was like I had all these A list, massive, major legends and huge names because th- th- there weren't there weren't hundreds and thousands of podcasts trying to get them on. Right. Um, it was like Jim Mars was just like, yeah, sure, why not? I mean, there's only there was only like maybe a dozen actual shows, so, um, and that's probably being generous. So to me, yeah, I find that it's harder now to, and not only that, but people have their own. Everybody's got their own fucking show, <laughs> so it's like, hey, you want to come on my show? And it's like, well, I got to tape my <laughs> show, um, and then it's uh, so there's a lot of yeah, it's just really. Uh, it's taken some time to get used to. I liken it to sort of working out or, or being a distance runner. It's I'm getting my legs under me. I'm starting to feel like I got it under, you know, I'm starting to get my legs out uh, going and starting to get my wind back. And, um, you know, I taped a show last Monday and then I did Conspiracy Normal, uh, the podcast um, last Tuesday and taped a show last night. And here I am doing this show tonight. So it's, I'm kind of building back up my my stamina and and trying to like find this sort of unique flavor of guests that we usually have on but all America. But yeah, like I said, it's a very I'm I'm getting sort of I kind of have to find my way back to the old old producer way of doing things and and booking guests and stuff like that. So it's a little bit more difficult than I recall. Um but I am enjoying it. I really enjoyed the shows I've I've taped so far and I've got like three in the can now. I think once I have like five episodes in the can, then then we're going to start. So I'm hoping that'll be like towards the end of October. Um, and with the big thing that I want to ask the Paratopia listeners to do, if they could be so kind, is that we're uh, we're moving Ben All of America. It's still going to be on the podcast feed, but it's also the hub of the show. Really, is going to be on YouTube. And we're in the process of moving our archives over to Banal of America on YouTube. Um, I think the first two seasons of the show are up now. Season three is going to start, I think, on Friday. And I'm not sure when we first had you on the show, but I think it was season three, maybe. So sometime in the next probably week week or two, uh, our first episode that we ever did will be put up on the YouTube channel. So I I asked the Paratopia listeners just to go – Get on the Banal of America YouTube page and subscribe, please, if you can. Um, that just helps the whole thing. It helps us get you know, seen by more people. And really, you need, you know, they, they just, they favor people with a lot of subscribers. So um, you can't you get, really can't get eyeballs on you unless you have more subscribers. And I find it kind of irritating uh, as an old school guy where I said to my guy, Bruce, who runs the YouTube channel, I'm like, well, what do they get if they subscribe? And he's like, well, they get a notification that you have a new episode up. It's like, well, shit, they don't get anything then. <laughs> so I, it doesn't cost you anything. You don't necessarily get anything. But if you subscribe, then we have more subscribers, and then YouTube takes us more seriously. So um, yeah. if you if the Paratopia listeners out there, yeah. That's that's worth it enough. If you think that Banal of America is worth 
getting into more earballs, then like and subscribe and and ring a bell or whatever the fuck. Like, why do you have to dance through hoops? Yeah. You know, like ring a bell. I mean, what does ringing a bell do that subscribing doesn't do? I don't get it. But do all that shit. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. So like, subscribe, ring the bell. Just punch in Banal of America on YouTube. You should be able to find it. And um, yeah, we're calling it the new show. We're calling it the Banal of America Revival. And it'll be, yeah, starting in about three weeks. The shows will be on the podcast feed. There's just so much shit that I've let go over the years. So wait a minute. I was laughing about it. The acronym is BOR. What? B O A R. Well, it's good because my name is Benal, and people always go, "Oh, Benal, like Benal." So you know, I kind of just can't. I just keep just keep circling back to boring. I guess I don't know. Well, if you need a picture of an actual <laughs> boar to go with that, I can just take one out my window. They they run by oh, every so often. Very nice. Yeah. Just let me know. Well, Tim, but, thank yeah, you. Yeah. So I'm uh, excited. You're going to be. Hold yeah. on. Hold on. Go ahead. I'm, I'm trying to wrap you You're up. Gonna, go I'm going to get you back yes. on the show. I know. I know. Um. I've purposely kind of like, as I said, I could just book a whole bunch of people I know, but I'm trying to sort of have some variety, get things, but you're on, you know, you are always on the fucking list for getting, getting on the show and, you know, you'll be back on Banal of America soon um, once we get everything up and running. So people will be able to check that out. And, nice. uh, you know, I, yeah, you can, you can sign me off now. It's all well, good. maybe I'll, uh, maybe <laughs> I'll, if people want to read, if, if people want to read my stuff, Go to coast to coast and check uh click the articles. That's where I try, you know, look, I don't really push this that much. I try to be humble about what I do with Coast to Coast, but I'll be perfectly honest. If you want like the most interesting, cutting edge, um pressing, strangest, you're not gonna f- you're gonna you're gonna see the story two days later on a whole bunch of other websites. You're gonna see it first on Coast to Coast, because I'm super diligent about trying to find the most obscure weirdest most fantastic stuff before anybody else can find it so yeah check that stuff out at coast coast am.com very good timmy thank you for doing this and there thanks for being a friend buddy my pleasure man you know i love you i and i i uh i consider you a dear i and i've said this off the air and you know it's true i consider you one of my very closest friends in this crazy field um and it's it's been a wild ride. It's been a great friendship. Um, I love that you're having so much fun out there in Hawaii. I just wish you were here because we, I, I run into people I know like Greg Bishop and Josh Cutchin and Steve Berg. You know, we run into each other at these events and stuff. I just wish we had more interaction and, and raising a ruckus. But I'm overdue for a trip to Hawaii. So that's a warning and a promise. Yes. Excellent. I will, I will take you up on both. <laughs> Wow, what a show. Thank you for listening, everyone. Thank you, Tim, for being a part of this. And as always, Jeff, we love you, we miss you, and thank you for your bold honesty and for embracing what I am certain on some level you found to be a humiliating circumstance. As much as you loved feeling as though you had this is being from the other side on your side for a while as much as you may have liked having these sit down chats and how it made you um, feel more balanced even and just relieved um, to speak it publicly to know what was coming and to do it anyway I think that was brave and I thank you for what you gave us. Love you, Jeff. Aloha, everyone. What's better than the radio and all those crimes with ass? It's our podcast! Not like the the podcast we love us. Never mind. Was that extraterrestrial?
you know I could really go for a real cooling with a crazy straw and a pop tart with lots. You've got to think outside the box. <laughs> On November 3rd, 4th, and 5th, the Strange Realities Conference is coming back to Nashville, Tennessee and streaming online. Come join us for three days exploring mysteries, supernatural, the occult, weird history, and more. Featuring lectures, presentations, and workshops by Tim Banal, Zach Hunt, Melvin Vance, Bryn Collier, Tobias Whalen, Brent Rain, Joshua Cutchin, Kiki Dombrowski, Recluse, Nathan Isaac, Christopher Ernst, Aaron Gullius, David Metcalf, Timothy Renner, Mallory Samwitzki, Soraya Azkap, and special guest Steve Berg as your Master of Ceremonies. Make sure to join us for the fun and informative weekend online and at SIR Nashville November 3rd and 4th and online only November 5th. Tickets are available at strangerealitiesconference.com. Nope.